I want to thank our sponsor for the, this year for the lecture series, the Palm Beach Post. This year's, and I also want to thank the uh, museum's education staff in particular, who worked very hard to organize these uh, lectures. Another one over here. To organize these lectures, to do the setup, to make sure the audio system is set up properly, and so on. It's a lot more look, work than it looks like, but like most difficult things, if it's done well, it looks easy. Um, this is uh, this year's the 100th anniversary of the Oversea Railroad, the completion of the most ambitious engineering feat ever undertaken by a private individual. Henry Flagler managed to, to accomplish it and arrived 100 years ago last Sunday in Key West aboard his train pulled by engine number 48 with his two private rail cars, rail car 91 and rail car 90. I hope you've had a chance to see rail car 91 housed in the Flagler Keenan Pavilion next to Whitehall. And we're lucky here at the museum to have tens of thousands of uh, articles related to the Oversea Railroad. Photographs, drawings, uh, important objects, ephemera of all kinds. Uh, we have clearly the largest collection and most relevant collection to this incredible event. If you had a chance to visit the history room on the second floor, then you had a chance to see the, the silver medallions made by Tiffany and Company for Flagler when he arrived in Key West, presented by the grateful citizens of Key West. And you had a chance to see the gold telegram that the employees of Henry Flagler had commissioned from Tiffany and Company, congratulating him on his achievement. We decided with that in mind that this year would be the theme, the appropriate thing for this year's lecture series would be the great engineering feats of the Gilded Age, and we've put together a series of six lectures to help us understand the context of engineering and how Gilded Age Americans viewed the world, and the kinds of things being accomplished uh, around the time of the Oversea Railroad. The other five lectures will include a lecture on Ferris's wheel, which is America's answer to the Eiffel Tower, by the way. Uh, and a lecture on how Goth uh, Gotham was conquered with a tunnel under the Hudson River, overseen uh, by a great uh, uh, railroad man uh, whose sister happened to be an artist, a, a gentleman named Alexander Cassatt, whose sister was Mary Cassatt. A lecture on Mulholland's aqueduct, not something many of us may be familiar with that here in the East, but without it, uh, the incredible city of Los Angeles would not have been possible and that too is one of our subjects. We'll also talk about the Titanic, but our lecture on the Titanic this year won't be about the disaster, but rather about the amazing engineering feat uh, that, represented, that was represented in the Titanic, uh, not the navigational error that brought it to uh, an early end. And of course, we'll talk about the Panama Canal, which is intimately related to the Overseas Railroad Project. So I hope you'll be able to join us for all six of our lectures. If for some reason you aren't able to be here physically, you can certainly join us on the web. All of our lectures are webcast live so that anyone can join us from anywhere in the world. Uh, last year we had a gentleman who joined us, I think, for all four lectures from Scotland. Uh, today we have people joining us from Michigan, Maine, Virginia. Anybody else? Anybody else out? West Palm Beach, of course, a few people. So, and they are able to hear the audio live and see the same slides you're seeing, and then they'll be able to ask questions at the end of the lecture, just as you'll, you'll be able to. Our uh, lecture today, oh, and by the way, many of you probably had a chance to see the Overseas Railroad exhibit that the museum had up this fall for about 12 weeks in our second floor gallery. That exhibit was adapted and reinstalled at the South Florida Fairgrounds to go along with the 72-foot-long uh, HO scale model of the Oversea Railroad. And the combination of that exhibit with the model railroad uh, is kind of an interesting thing to see. So if you haven't yet seen that, you do have one afternoon left or evening left to see it. The fair closes this evening, I believe, 10 o'clock. And uh, you could uh, still see that exhibit and the model if you like. Our lecture today is Dr. Les Staniford. Um, he has, for more than a quarter of a century, been the director of the Florida International University, 
creative writing program, and he attended the Air Force Academy, which is interesting as an Air Force veteran. Uh, I identify with that, although I didn't attend the Academy. He attended Columbia University Law School. He has a bachelor's in psychology, a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Utah, and he even worked for the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Park Service. So he's had quite a lot of experience in a variety of backgrounds, which I'm sure helps to make him a great writer. He, uh, his creative writing included a, a series of books called uh, The Deal Series, about John Deal, an honest contractor in South Florida. <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh. They do exist. Um, and I've gotten a big kick out of reading them because they're set in South Florida, so we can identify the locales and some of the culture uh, woven into those stories. He has uh, other books he's written connected to our time period, uh, besides The Last Train to Paradise, which we'll talk more about in a second. Uh, he wrote a book on the relationship between Carnegie and Frick. He wrote a book on Dickens and how uh, The Christmas Carol changed Dickens' life and our Christmas, tra Christmas traditions. And he wrote a history on the city of, uh, or capital city uh, of Washington, D.C. He, of course, we're, he's here today because of his uh, book, The Last Train to Paradise, a story about the Overseas Railroad and uh, how it uh, was built and how it uh, ended its life in the 1930s. The Last Train to Paradise, I believe, is his most commercially successful book. Five or six printings hardbound? Is it five or six? Seven. Five in hardcover, 14 in. Five in hardcover, 14 in softcover. In fact, it's been so popular this year, the publisher told us this week that they're out of print once again, but they'll be back in print February 8th. Uh, and so that's four, did you say 14? 19 all together. 19 all together. See, who counts? I don't know. 19 all together plus a centennial edition that the museum has published. It's hardbound, heavily illustrated, more than 150 photographs, uh, which you'll see today as well. So a very uh, special book as far as the museum is, is concerned and the best account of the building of the Overseas Railroad there is to, to, um, to read. He has too many awards to list here. Uh, he is here with his wife, Kimberly, who's a psychotherapist. I'm sure that helps if you're a writer. <laughs> We're happy to have you here, Kimberly. And I, you'll notice that at your seats, uh, a couple of publications, a season program guide outlining all of our programs, our lecture series, music series, exhibitions. In fact, uh, Tuesday we open a, an exhibition on Tiffany lamps on Clara Driscoll and the, and the Tiffany girls who designed and built the amazing Tiffany lamps we've all come to value so much. This Tuesday evening, a lecture on Carrere and Hastings, the architects of Whitehall, uh, actually, the architects that Henry Flagler gave uh, a first opportunity to when they were back in their 23, 24 years old, when they designed the Hotel Ponce de Leon uh, in Florida, in St. Augustine, who went on to design not only Whitehall, but the Frick Collection in New York, the New York Public Library, to be the chief architects for the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, and so on and so on. They had amazing careers, but it was Henry Flagler who recognized their talent first. And of course, uh, a postcard for the next lecture about Ferris's amazing wheel, um, which will happen here in the Grand Ballroom a week from today at 3 o'clock. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Les Stanford to the Whitehall Lecture Series. Thank you very much for that generous introduction, John. It's always a pleasure to be here, see you again, and so many friends that I've made up this way over the past 10 or 11 years of my association with Henry Flagler and his many accomplishments. And this room, I'm always pleased to be. I was uh, telling my wife just before we began that we need a ballroom. <laughs> I'm here uh, because of, really, because of Last Train to Paradise and, and the fact that I wrote that book 
back in uh, 2000, was published in 2002. Before that, as John tells you, I was a, a novelist. I'd written 10 books, 10 novels, and uh, one of the big differences between writing a book like Last Train to Paradise and uh, one of the John Deal books is that when you get to a point in uh, your novel where you need a fact, as I tell my students, you just make it up. <laughs> but uh, when you're writing a book like Last Train to Paradise, you can't make it up. And if you get to a point in the story that you're trying to tell where you don't have that fact, then back to your sources, uh, to the library, uh, to an interviewee, you must go. And if you can't find the fact, then you've got to change the story to fit the facts that you do have. I think any journalist worth her or his salt could have told me that to begin with, but because I was a novelist, it was something of a learning experience for me. And I also want to thank John Blades for his, his help, all the staff here for his help. You come to understand once you begin to research historical subjects for books. Sometimes you encounter repositories of facts that uh, uh, where the guardians of the gate are not so generous. It's, it's as if they've assembled all this material and they see it as theirs. And uh, uh, anyone who might want to uh, render these facts in a, a new edition is sometimes regarded as an interloper. I don't know how many of you might have seen the movie Citizen Kane where the reporter finally makes his way to the archives of what's obviously the William Randolph Hearst papers and uh, he feels like he's broken into a bank uh, there and sometimes you get that but I'm happy to say that when I came to the Flagler Museum they could not have been more helpful and furthermore I could not have written that book without the help of John Blades and his staff and as far as I'm concerned they exemplify what a museum of this sort is, is all about trying to share with the world some of the amazing uh, things that the uh, subject has, has had to do with. So thank you again John and uh, I know all of you who are, have been associated with the museum over the years appreciate it as well. The other thing I might say before I get to my prepared remarks is that I was reading a review in the New York Times, I think it was last Sunday, of a book about, I think it's called The Mormon People, and the reviewer was saying, um, you know, there are a number of books of history of this sort, uh, read 10, write the 11th, and uh, I thought, uh-oh, here it comes, he's going to get after the sport writer, he said, but quite often it turns out that the 11th is the best because, and he went on to explain, it attempts to synthesize the story, so uh, not so much to uh, unearth yet some more minutia about the, the subject. And I have to say, when I sat down to talk about myself, uh, the material that's in Last Train to Paradise, I realized it had never been my intention to be an archaeological historian, that is, to find some uh, bit of history that had never before been unearthed, but rather to take a new look at some things that had been known for a long time to try to bring a new appreciation to the material for the modern audience. I was really never the best history student in high school, history and college. Uh, history was presented to me chiefly as a series of names and dates to be memorized and I was a pretty good memorizer but the fact is that the minute the test was over all of that went right out of my head there's only so much room on the hard drive after all and you know you've got to uh, stay fresh uh, to this day I'm aware that 1066 is a far more important date than 1065 or 1067 for instance but I'm not quite sure why and even if you told me, I'd forget it by the time I got to the parking lot. But I do remember stories about history. I remember uh, anecdotes about, uh, of course, Alexander the Great hacking through the Gordian Knot with a sword, you know, the, and the undoable Gordian Knot, and well, he showed them. I remember uh, stories about Germans and, uh, and Allied troops, caroling, British troops, caroling one another back and forth in the frozen 
lines in 1914 during a truce that they uh, called themselves so that they could sing Christmas carols, uh, something of an interesting commentary on war and World War I. Those are the things I, I tend to remember. And when I read that review in the Times, I said, you know what, I think that the fellow is, in, in a way, accurately describing what it is I try to do, that is to synthesize all this material. I remember looking at this welter of facts that I had before me after doing all this research here and elsewhere for uh, the Flagler's project and asking myself, Les, what on earth are you going to do with all of this material? And finally, having been a novelist for that time, I said, tell the story. What I'm going to share with you today begins with a little epigraph. Ponce de Leon discovered Florida, perhaps. Henry Flagler found a use for it. <laughs> In the late 1860s, a young grain and kerosene merchant from Cleveland by the name of John D. Rockefeller was looking for a partner to help bankroll a venture into the burgeoning new business of oil. He found the perfect man in Henry Flagler, a natural salesman as outgoing and innovative as Rockefeller was reserved and detail-oriented. The two soon became fast friends and more significantly a matchless business team. Within a few short months, they had begun a process of consolidation among the mom and pop refineries of northern Ohio that would one day become the most ruthless, most powerful business enterprise ever assembled, Standard Oil. And yet, while Rockefeller has become inextricably entwined with the lore of the company he helped to found, his name, a synonym the world over for unbridled wealth and influence, Flagler is, comparatively speaking, unknown. Even by Rockefeller's own account, it was Flagler's vim and push that was responsible for the company's rise. He invariably wanted to go ahead and accomplish great projects of all kinds, Rockefeller said. And to his wonderful energy is due much of the rapid progress of the company in the early days. But how could it come to be that Rockefeller would grow to legendary status while Flagler, the, month, the man who once called the shots at Standard Oil, whose wealth surpassed at a time even that of the great John D., should become an Ozymandian footnote? Flagler had an explanation of his own. I would have been a rich man, he said as he neared his death, if it hadn't been for Florida. <laughs> and what he really meant was, I'd have been all right if I hadn't tried to build that damnable railroad across the ocean. Bored with oil and the machinations of the juggernaut that he had created, Flagler had traveled to Florida with an ailing wife for a much needed rest. What he discovered there was to hold him in sway for the rest of his life. He began a process of unprecedented development spearheaded by the push of railway lines down the eastern coast of the state, establishing Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach, Palm Beach, and Miami as centers of commerce and tourism. And even when he ran out of land to build on, Flagler did not stop. He had his sights set on Key West and Cuba and the Panama Canal after that. All that was necessary was to build a railroad over a hundred or so miles of open water, and Flagler was not about to let that deter him. One of the richest men in the world was determined to undertake the greatest engineering feat ever conceived, and it would all culminate one day when the most powerful storm ever to strike American shores came calling. It was an unprecedented decision for Henry Flagler to undertake the building of the Florida East Coast Railway's 156-mile extension from mainland Florida to Key West. Yet it is hard to imagine that even he could conceive of how history would gauge the vast ambition, great sacrifice, and unprecedented accomplishment that the project would come to embody. There are no more men like Henry Flagler, and there are no more dreams like his. Today we have corporate consolidators and mega retailers and software titans and their minions who seek to bridge gaps measured in mil millimicrons and nanoseconds. Such accomplishments may be dizzying in their own right, but that kind of bridge building can't hold a candle to his. The railroad across the sea, the building of which took place from 1905 to 1912, was a gargantuan enterprise that for its time, dismissed by many as Flagler's folly when it was announced and proclaimed as the eighth wonder of the world when it was finally finished. 
Experts thought that the project to be was more daunting than the construction of the 100 long mile 100 mile long Suez Canal in 1859 to 69. And its project attracted as much public attention as did the overseas uh, contemporary undertaking, the Panama Canal of 1904-14. to The cost was unprecedented as well. The 742-mile California link of the Union Pacific Railroad, joined by the driving of the Golden Spike in Promontory, Utah in 1869, had cost only $23 million. Totals for the overseas railroad, less than a quarter of that length, would soar beyond 27 million, some say as much as 35 to 50 million dollars. But even more formidable was the particular nature of the work. Never before in road building history had such a thing been proposed, to cross a 156 mile expanse, much of it over open water by rail. There had been dreams of a railway to Key West as early as the 1830s when that city was a thriving Caribbean port and Miami was nothing but a fly speck in the American tropics, known then as Fort Dallas. In the 70 years that followed the first newspaper editorial's proposal of such a scheme, three railway companies had actually sought state charters for the construction of a railroad to Key West. But it was like a developer tying up the rights to lots on the moon. Not a dime had been spent, not a spadeful of earth had been turned on the Key West Railroad. It was deemed patently impossible beyond the reach of available technology, and even if it was were possible, the sheer cost would make the railway impractical, beyond the reach of return on investment. How then to account for the announcement made in 1904 by Flagler, one of the world's wealthiest men? We will go to Key West. The man who had created Florida told Joseph Parrott, chief of operations for Flagler's Florida East Coast Railway operations, I will ride my own iron there before I die. Well, one way to account for this uh, comes, dates back to 1891. On the west coast of Florida, and perhaps inspired by Flagler's notoriety, a man named Henry Plant had been uh, buying up a series of existing narrow-gauge railroads with the stated intention of extending a line all the way from Tampa to Miami. Plant had also built a deep-water port that transformed Tampa into an important port on the Gulf of Mexico, and by 1891 had completed his own extravagant hotel the Tampa Bay, which at $3 million had considerably exceeded the costs of Flagler's Ponce de Leon, completed at a cost of $2.5 million. It's today Flagler College, uh, where my daughter's a senior. Hope some of you will visit. Goaded by the outspoken plant's vow to outdo him, Flagler considered what he might play as a trump card. In a letter written to the Miami Herald many years later, Jefferson Brown, a Key West resident and one-time president of the Florida Senate, recalls being taken aside by Flagler during the grand opening of the Tampa Bay Hotel in 1891. During that conversation, Brown said, Flagler first proposed him the notion of extending his own railroad another 400 or so miles to the south and where it was at the time, all the way to Key West. Flagler told Brown that in that conversation that the logical end of all railroad building in Florida was to reach a deep water terminus in proximity to Central and South America. In fact, some have argued, as some have argued, that had Flagler been successful in getting the U.S. government to help him pay for the costs of dredging such a harbor in Miami's Biscayne Bay, there might never have been a Key West extension. In any case, the Panama Canal was sure to be built one day, Flagler told Brown back in 1891. And while, while Plant's imported symphony played and opera stars sang, the nearest deep water port in the United States was sure to have an enormous advantage, Flagler said. It soon became clear to Brown in his recollection that Flagler was seeking Brown's assistance in seeing that the existing government franchises that had been granted for building such a line by the Florida le legislature be set aside. In 1883, in fact, General John B. Gordon of Georgia had obtained the first uh, franchise from the state for the building of a railroad to Key West, but Gordon had had little capital of his own and had secured the rights in hopes of attracting deep-pocketed investors to the project. He did manage to build a few miles of track on the mainland, but Gordon had gone broke 
and other speculators had picked up the, the franchise in his turn. As Flagler argued to Brown, this series of petitioners were only schemers involved in the grossest speculation, not un unlike contemporary consortiums tying up internet domain, internet domain names or seeking rights to the first Burger King franchise on Mars. Brown listened intently to Flagler and apparently unimpressed by the thousands of guests that strolled and rode rickshaws about the grounds of Plants Hotel, finally gave his agreement to the railroad man from the other side of the state sensing that Henry Flagler was the one man in all creation who might be able to pull off the impossible feat. Warming to the possibilities of uh, such a railroad would mean to his consist uh, warming to the possibilities such a railroad would mean to his constituents constituency, Brown in 1894 wrote an essay entitled Across the Gulf by Rail to Key West, which was published in the National Ge Geographic in June of 1896. Key West will, within a short time, be connected with the mainland by a railroad, Brown asserted and added. It is not too much to say that upon the completion of the, what he called the Nicaragua Canal, Key West will become the most important city in the South. Brown seemed to overlook the fact that the canal project, which had been mired in political maneuverings for more than 20 years, had also been assaulted by critics who thought it, too, a crackpot notion as much as a practical proposal. Of the latter, he was willing to grant, of the, of the railroad project, Brown was willing to grant that its having no precedent could possibly make it, like all other enterprises, a subject for a time of incredulity and distrust. Still, Brown asserted, it presents no difficulties that are insurmountable. In his piece, Brown laid out a route from Key West northward over the island, which he said would be connected, protected by the neighboring Florida reef, safe from high seas, even in the severest of hurricanes. If the several lighthouses that had been built along the reef had not been toppled, he reasoned, why worry about tracks, trestles, and bridges? As to who was capable of building this mighty road, Brown ended that piece with another bold declaration. The building of a railroad to Key West would be a fitting consummation of Mr. Flagler's career, and his name would be handed down to posterity, linked to one of the grandest achievements of modern times. Sometimes such uh, wild boasting comes true, as we see. Brown had, by 1895, carried out his promises of aid to Flagler, using his position as, this, as uh, leader of the Senate to see that all legislative impediments to Flagler's plans were disposed of. Shortly thereafter, Flagler recombined all of his rail holdings in the state into an entity known as the Florida East Coast Railroad Company and gave official notification that it was his intention to extend that system all the way to Key West. The proposal was so grandiose on the face of it that it might have lumped Flagler's Key West intentions into the same category as those of earlier speculators, but he was granted that charter by the legislator to extend the line to Miami, a move that went beyond mere permission to spend a great deal of money. An 1889 act of the Florida legislature set aside some 10 million acres of land to be deeded to entrepreneurs willing to build new railway lines and thus bolster the, bolster the state's economic infrastructure. As a result, Flagler would be able to lay claim to 8,000 acres of land for every mile of track he built, and in the end he would control nearly 2 million acres of land for which he had essentially paid nothing. The announcement that the Key West extension would actually go forward would have to wait for 10 years until Congress finally approved the construction of the Panama Canal. But even with that supposed justification, the evidence suggests that Flagler, who was 75 at the time that the final leg of his railroad began its construction, and well versed in the vicissitudes of the railroading business, had other motives than making a profit. It is this writer's belief that Flagler's declaration can be attributed in large part to an other era belief in one's own capabilities, a brook no obstacles desire to accomplish what no man had before. And despite the cost of many millions of dollars in the lives of hundreds of men, Flagler's vision was to take shape. Flagler was buoyed by his system manager, Joe Parrott's insistence that the work was theoretically possible and he found a young engineer named William Crome to survey the best route. The final 
essential member of the team, perhaps its most crucial was Joseph C. Meredith, a man as slight as Chrome was robust. Meredith, who had grown up in Kansas City, about as far from any ocean as it is possible to get, was an employee of the Missouri Valley Bridge Company and had just spent two years in Tampico, Mexico, building a massive network of piers and docks using relatively new techniques and reinforced concrete. When Meredith, after careful study, concurred that the project was possible, it was all that Flagler needed to hear. For more than eight years, a force comprised of thousands upon thousands of uneducated Southern blacks, unemployed Bowery denizens, Italian and Spanish immigrants, Cayman Islander boatsmen, Greek sponge divers, Keys natives or conks, and Cuban high wire dancers, high iron dancers, endured never before, hard, never before encountered hardships in the service of Flagler's vision. And these men ventured out across what was literal terra incognita, they encountered a series of obstacles unforeseen by planners. There were uncharted, seemingly bottomless lakes to cross, daunting stretches of ocean to stitch with arches never before conceived, and even where there seemed dry land to build upon, it proved to be maddeningly unstable, land unique to the fabled Florida Keys. In addition to the inherent life-threatening dangers of any massive building project, there were insects, disease, boredom, exhaustion, and isolation to be dealt with. Even the slightest inconveniences turned into major battles, as witnessed in this account, Engineer Chief, Assistant Chief Engineer William Crone gives of the head nets necessary to thwart the plague-like attacks of mosquitoes and sand fleas. Here he's speaking. The best was one designed from Cape by uh, Cape Sable squatters. It is built to use over a stiff for use over a stiff brimmed hat and consists of a band of canvas fitting closely around the crown of the hat. To this is sewed a strip of close mesh copper wire netting extending down the back and curving over the shoulders to the level of the chin. Cheesecloth is taped around the bottom of the copper gauze and, tacked, and tucked beneath the coat, which is buttoned up over it. Imagine working in 95 degree heat in such a contraption. There was also the matter of keeping an isolated workforce in line. Once men who had often uh, been lured by unscrupulous labor contractors left Miami for work on the project and discovered how difficult the work actually was, desertion became the order of the day. Despite a generous pay scale, good food, and excellent medical care, Flagler endured claims that he was running a forced labor camp and actually had to defend himself in a federal court uh, against a suit in a federal court in New York City. The suit was summarily dismissed, but it was one more harrowing obstacle among the 101 others the project presented. Not all distractions were quite, quite as dire, although they were nothing Flagler tolerated. One group of local conks raised a wreck steamer and turned it into a floating casino cum bordello for isolated workers. Other conks found a ready reception for the age-old Keys practice of rum running. Alcoholism and venereal disease were chronic problems, but by far the most deadly threat was hurricane. The Keys, once characterized by as worthless, chaotic fragments of coral reef, limestone, and mangrove swamp, are actually not islands at all, but remnants of an ancient underwater reef, which time and geologic accident have allowed to jut above the waterline here and there. Most of the Keys measure well under a half mile in width. The highest, uh, the highest point above sea level south of the Florida mainland is 16 feet, less than the height of the roof of a Greyhound bus, and the vast majority of the keys rest far below that. When even a minimal hurricane approaches land, it pushes a tidal surge, or in other words, is tidal wave, ahead of it, four to eight feet, at their mildest. Four such storms did swoop, sweep over the Keys during the span of the road's life, and each time the cost was enormous, both in terms of dollars and in lives. The first in 1906 took workers entirely by surprise. One quarter's boat, or floating dormitory, was ripped loose from its moorings and swept out to sea with 140 men on board. 
One man saved himself by climbing into an empty water tank he unbolted from the craft. That tank was discovered floating in the waters off Nassau several days later. Those who chanced upon it were astonished to find a man inside, Jonah-like, delirious, but still alive. Another man named Mullen was the sole occupant of a cement barge that was torn from anchor during the storm and pulled out to a reef that was still in sight of shore. Witnesses reported that Mullen kept the barge's boiler stoked and its lights ablaze for nearly an hour until the craft was finally swallowed by the surge. Mullen's body was never found. Such natural disasters were daunting, of course, but a, a look at one of the op engineer, closer look at one of the engineering obstacles along the way shows how difficult the everyday work was as well. It was at mile marker 65, the nominal dividing line between the upper and middle keys, that the first of the truly awe-inspiring bridges would have to be constructed, spanning an uninterrupted 2.7 miles of water before reaching a fly speck of land now known as Conk Key. Whereas all the bridge work and the 100 miles or so of construction up until that point constructed principally of low-lying trestle work, this was the first undertaking that would truly tax the ingenuity of Flagler's engineers. In Flagler's eyes, the Long Key Viaduct was the essential link that would culminate the first phase of his impossible project. Once the viaduct was finished, it would connect with 16 miles of track that had already been laid on Grassy Key, the next in the southwestward chain uh, below Long Key where uh, yet another in a series of under unforeseen developments had forced Flagler to announce a temporary slowdown for the project. One of his key assumptions to the financial success of the extension had always been the establishment of a deep water port in, port in the southernmost city, one which could accommodate the vast amount of ocean-going steamship traffic on its way to and from the new Panama Canal. But Flagler's plans were dealt a formidable blow in 1908 when the U.S. Navy refused to grant permission to dredge the waters of Key West Harbor to build up the huge dock area. Though Flagler suspected, it was the influence of his old nemesis, Theodore Roosevelt, who had, of course, uh, carried on a long campaign against Standard Oil and other trust-busting activities. Flagler suspected it was Theodore Roosevelt who was responsible for the setback. His response was typically pragmatic. He dispatched a team of engineers to study the water south of Knight's Key off Key Vaca, ostensibly to see whether or not his deep water port might be relocated there, possibly replacing Key West as the ultimate destination. It was news that stunned Key Westers and delighted Middle Key's residents, whose dreams of supplanting Key West was as the most influential city in all of Florida, were suddenly given life. Meanwhile, Meredith Coe and others were hard at work on, on forging this last link between Knight's Key and the nearly 100 miles of track that snaked its way down the archipelago to languish just to the north. Renderings for the new bridge with more than 180 steel reinforced concrete arches rising 35 feet above the water resembled nothing so much as a great Roman aqueduct marching across the sea. The bridge was so striking in its appearance that Flagler would come to call it his favorite of all those built on the line. Spokesmen for the company were fond of quoting the statistics derived from the building of this viaduct. 286,000 barrels of cement uh, required for the arches and the pilings, must, much of it of a special underwater hardening uh, type that would have to be imported from Germany. There were 177,000 cubic yards of crushed rock hauled down, some of it used to fill the inner chambers of the arches and create the actual railroad bed, the rest to be blended with the cement and concrete, and another 100,000 cubic yards of sand, enough to cover all of Miami's famed South Beach to make concrete. There would be, a six, there would be 612,000 feet of piling sunk to create cubic feet of piling sunk to create the underpinnings of the span and 5,000 tons of steel and more than two and a half million feet of timbers used to build the forms. Yet the numbers, all those numbers, great as they are, give little sense of the difficulty that was involved uh, in building that great chain of archways. It is perfectly simple 
Flagler's brave words surely echoed in the minds of the builders as they struggled. To get to Key West, he said he had said initially, all you have to do is build one concrete arch, and then another, and then another, and suddenly you're in Key West. However, these arches were being built not on dry land, but in the middle of an ocean that varied in depth anywhere from 10 to 30 feet. For every one of those more than 180 arches, each spanning a distance of over 50 feet, a flotilla of barges and work boats had to be moved into place, whereupon the intricate process would begin. William Venable, the division engineer for the FEC, detailed the nature of the work in an article that uh, graced the pages of engineering record for 1907. First, pilings had to be driven through sand and bottom muck into the bedrock to serve as anchors for the arches themselves and to prevent side-to-side -side movement of the supports that might be occasioned by tide surges. Sometimes the piling would reach bedrock quickly. Other times it would mean hours of deafening, precarious work exacerbated by storms and squalls, currents that were always shifting the barges, tilting the heavy steam-driven equipment out of place and all the other surprises that nature seemed fond of springing. At times, the piling being driven just a few feet away from one that had been stabilized in a day or less would sink and sink into a sea bottom that suddenly seemed as porous as quicksand. Exasperated engineers would e could either keep on pounding, hoping to strike rock before reaching China, or simply give up move their rigs a bit to one side or the other and hope that this time they wouldn't hit another hidden pocket of sand. After the pilings were finally secured, a rectangular wooden form or coffer dam was constructed about the cluster of pilings, the top of the form poking a few feet above the surface of the water, its base secured in the sea bottom and shored up by submerged sandbags piled about its perimeter. Once this form was secured in place, a layer of the special German underwater cement uh, would be, uh, would be applied. And surrounding the pilings and forming a watertight seal two to four feet thick depending on the size of the pier resting directly above upon the ocean floor. After the seal had set for two or three days water and debris would be sucked out of the form by large barge mounted pumps and leaks in the form patch so that workers could build a second more refined form inside the first. This would receive the latticework network of reinforcement steel woven around and about the pilings and then the hole would be filled with concrete to form a pedestal, its top projecting 10 feet or so out of the water and stuttered with a veritable hydra head of steel reinforcement rods left waving in the air to eventually tie in to the last piece of the process. In the final step and after a week or so of hardening, a pair of these pedestals would be joined by yet another form one built on land and transported to the site by barge, and this in the shape of an arch. Once the arch form had been set in place, more concrete would be poured atop it. The result was one gracefully curved 55-foot link in what would eventually become a, heart, a breathtaking chain of arches across the sea. I hesitated to read that, but uh, John asked me to give some sense of the difficulty of this. And if that sounds tedious to you, imagine what it must have been like to spend days and days and weeks and weeks actually doing it. Such work wore out laborers, of course, but even Flagler's trusted project managers were not immune to, these, to such rigors. Chrome was forced off the project for several months by exhaustion, and J.C. Meredith, project engineer, a diabetic, died in 1909, sat by the demands placed upon him. Following a denial of, of other building per permits by the federal government midway through the project, Flagler himself was stricken, stricken ill. Gleeful, muckraking journalists reported that his illness was in fact a nervous breakdown brought on by the project's disintegration and one newspaper went so far as to prepare a lengthy obituary on him, further declaring that work on the Key West Railroad had been abandoned. The writers, as the saying has it, were greatly misinformed. Flagler rallied and work soon resumed on the Overseas Railroad, including the prodigious Seven Mile Bridge, never called Seven Mile Bridge at the time, by the way, longest of the 40-odd spans required to link the keys. Finally, on January 22, 1912, the first train from New York to Key West 
pulled into the station at the end of the American Trail. Foremost among its passengers, who included Assistant Secretary of War Robert Shaw Oliver and diplomats from Italy, Mexico, Portugal, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Guatemala, San Salvador, and Uruguay, was Henry Flagler. Not quite three weeks had passed since he had celebrated his 82nd birthday. Jubilation was the order of the day, and booking agents could hardly keep up with the demand for passage on the new railway across the sea. Flagler, a savvy businessman to be sure, had publicly stated that he wanted to go to Key West with the intent of establishing a deep water port which would be 300 miles closer to the Panama Canal than any other in the States. But, as I say, permission for that dredging op operation was denied <clears throat> and the immediate, uh, by, the, by the Navy, and the immediate effect of the railroad's arrival on Key West which had always been a working man's town, home to fishermen and sailors, sponge divers and cigar makers, to, was to make it for the first time in its history a tourist destination. Passengers on the Havana Special delighted in the breathtaking views across the shallows, and they wrote of watching schools of dolphin leaping from the currents beneath the bridge. Others reported watching sharks cruising along in the shadows cast by the cars crossing the bridges like a exotic pacer fish drawn by an unknown prospect. And while Flagler had beaten the naysayers on one count, his critics were at least half right. The project remained deeply in the red, never coming close to a return on its monumental costs. In fact, the delight of railway passengers was the chief practical result of Flagler's massive undertaking in its day. As though the desire to ride his own iron to Key West had been the last thing sustaining him, Flagler's health began to deteriorate soon after. Less than a year later he had died, though he left his widow the world's richest and bequeathing his only son next to nothing. Despite all the setbacks, building the, the uh, extension had been dealt to him and his complaints about how the building of Florida had lightened his pockets. The railroad across the ocean would live on for 22 more years until a will even greater than Flagler's rose up in opposition. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration had embarked upon their own ambitious project to extend a route for motor cars alongside the railroad right away in the Middle Keys. Using a workforce of underpaid, out-of-work veterans eager for any opportunity in the depths of the Depression, the company had scarcely, uh, had scarcely established a work camp near Isla Morada when tragedy struck. The hurricane of 1935 swept through the Matacumbis, packing the most powerful, potent winds ever to strike American shores and bringing with it a tidal wave of 20 feet to sweep across land 8 to 10 feet above sea level. It took out most of the those tent cities where workers were housed and it is said that as many as 700 people died that night. The railroad was destroyed and the burgeoning highway flattened. It remains today one of the worst industrial disasters ever recorded. And yet the story of Flagler and his railroad remains in my mind an awesome, awe-inspiring one, a testament to a time when one man could take on the impossible and other men would willingly, even gladly, sacrifice in service of such a vision. Flagler was 75 when he began his project in 1905, and it would be hard to argue that making more money was his chief object. He had been in railroading in Florida for some 20 years, and one company report for the Florida East Coast Railway estimated that the total net profit for the line from 1890 on up uh, to that time was less than $9,000 in total. He had his practical justifications, it is true, but just as likely that the same, it is just as likely that the same impulse that sent him out of oil and off to Florida to become a builder and a creator was the same impulse that goaded him to build his impossible railroad and in doing so stitched the last piece of the American continent to the main. He did it as much as anything because it was an awesome prospect there to be done, and he believed that he was the man who could do it. Ultimately, most men who worked on the project fell under the same thrall. As one of his managers put it, his time was running out for Flagler. There isn't a man working on this project who wouldn't give a year or two of his own life to get Mr. Flagler's railroad to Key West before he dies. 
Much the same spirit has uh, pervaded another work team just up the coast at Cape Canaveral. Despite the dangers and the setbacks and the continuing calls that what had been undertaken was impractical, the dream of accomplishing the impossible simply would not die. Henry Flagler was no angelic, bleeding heart, though he was quite generous to the citizens of what he often called his domain in Florida. And he was, and he was no effusive philosopher offering <coughs> intricate justifications for his undertakings. He preferred to let his actions do his talking for him, and those actions speak volumes. This is a man who virtually created Florida as we know it, the east coast of it anyway, and even if he had intentions of making money while he did so, if that was all that was on his mind, he could have chosen to simply do uh, what John D. Rockefeller had done, and that was reinvest his dividends in Standard Oil and have a lot easier time of it. But I ask you, where would that have left us here in Florida? Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Ormond Beach, Daytona Beach, Palm Beach, Miami, which by the way, Flagler had to fight to keep from having it called Flagler City. And, of course, Key West. Someone asked me a while back why I was drawn to write this particular book, and all I could do was stare. After all, I said, this story concerns one of the richest men in uh, the world, undertaking one of the most difficult engineering feats ever, and all of it blown away by the worst hurricane ever to strike American shores. I thought that would be a lot better story than one of, about how a CEO steals all the stockholders' money and then builds himself a really big house. <laughs> Henry Flagler got his own iron all the way across the ocean to Key West and in doing so closed the last gap in the American frontier. If he was a robber baron, then what do we call the fellows from Worldcom and Tyco and Enron and all the rest? And as for the Madoffs, <laughs> well, what I think is this. We could use a few more CEOs around like Henry Morrison Flagler today. Thank you. I've got a little show and tell, which I'll very quickly run through, and then we'll have a few minutes for uh, 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 questions and, and comments. I'm always interested to hear what you're interested in, but I thought you might like to see just a few things, a few illustrations of some of the stuff I've just spoken about. There's a, the new addition that John Blades and the museum made uh, possible, and that's an engineering project of its own. We don't have time to talk about, but it was great to work with them on it. That's the original uh, book that came out with a picture of Flagler. That's the paperback. Now three incarnations. Not often a writer gets to uh, uh, be associated with so much and over such a long period of time. So I feel very fortunate. There's Flagler when he got married to his first wife in 1853. She's the one with the matching top hat uh, standing. That's his sister-in-law on his, on his left. That's uh, Mary Harkness Flagler. That's his second wife who was a, a bit of a, a, a troublesome sort. Uh, she's a fascinating character to read about. And people have often come up to me and said, why don't you write a book about Ida Alice Schwartz? And I assure you, you could. There's his third wife, Mary Lily Keenan, who, uh, uh, when Flagler married her, uh, uh, he said, uh, what would you like for a wedding present, darling? And she said, well, how about a marble palace? I've always wanted one. And uh, we're sitting in that wedding gift. Uh, as a matter of fact, she was 34 and he 72 when they married, and as you can imagine, tongues wag. But by all accounts, they lived, he lived the last 12 years of his life happily married to her. There's uh, Mamarin, uh, um, Satan's Toe, the first grand home that Flagler lived in in all his life and where I think he got many of the ideas for some of the grandeur he reproduced in Florida. This is on the uh, uh, north shore of Long Island Sound in Mamaroneck, New York. It's since been destroyed. There's, of course, the breakers right across the street. I hope some of you have stayed there. It's like staying in the, I say, walking into the New York Public Library and discovering they have rooms for rent. That's just a fabulous sense of another time. 
here uh, you walk through that wonderful room to get here. This is Miami at the time when uh, the railroad was being conceived of, and one of the problems that I didn't get to in the talk was the lack of infrastructure. There were less than a thousand people in Miami even at that time. No factories, no work source, no uh, uh, source of materials. Uh, all of that had to be brought from other places in the United States and even so far away as Europe. That was one of the reasons for the great uh, expense. There is uh, Meredith, who agreed to go to work. He was the expert in that brand new medium called reinforced concrete. There's Chrome, who took over when Meredith died. There's how some of the, most of the work got done, not with heavy equipment, not with bulldozers. There were no such things. Axe, pick, shovel, uh, and uh, wheelbarrow. Try to imagine, and wearing those helmets. I think most of the guys said, oh, the heck with it. Let the mosquitoes take what they will and more of the, the chopping through mangroves and there's uh, the work crew, one of the work crews the, of the men. They came from all over. Here we are surveying the trail, imagine. Normally you set up a couple of transits and uh, say put the railroad here. This is a surveyor at work in, near Snake Creek in, in 1907. That's one of the few mechanized pieces of equipment, essentially a steam shovel bolted to a barge which chewed out not the way for the railroad, it uh, would dig up this uh, canal, but the purpose of the canal the, that the uh, barge made for itself as it went down the Keys was not the canal itself, but the muck that it piled up to the side upon which to lay the track. There was no, there is no source of fresh water in the Keys, it all had to be brought down in cedar uh, tanks like this every day for the boilers, for the men, for the machines, for the horses, and, and uh, donkeys and whatnot. The uh, waters of the Keys are too shallow for boats to get very close to shore. They had to build rickety docks at every stop along the way and then more wheelbarrows brought stuff in. It's very difficult to, to do the slightest thing down there. There's one of those quarters boats, the likes of which was uh, torn, off, uh, uh, torn away and, and crashed out on the reef and could have been those guys who died, we're not sure. That's a survey party with Flagler in the middle and Joseph Parrott in the golf uh, cap right to uh, your left and hit Flagler's right. There's one of those arches being built that I give you the long explanation for. There's the jumping off of Seven Mile Bridge. They called it the Great One. It was actually in their eyes three bridges. One to Pigeon Key, then across the deep water just south of Pigeon Key, and then a third section, across, an arch section that across the shallow waters as it got closer to the other end. That's uh, more, and there it is, uh, once it had become a highway and, a, uh, and called a seven mile bridge by the highway builders in the 1930s, and uh, late 30s and 40s. They were out there building a highway or a, a, a railroad out of sight of land uh, when they were working on that span. Here's the superstructure for Bahia Honda. That's the only typical steel bridge in the whole span. It still stands, as many of you know. And I think one of the most remarkable sites. There's Long Key Fishing Camp, which was built for the uh, benefit of some of the middle and upper managers to rest along the way. It became a resort after the railroad was finally completed. And Zane Gray used to winter there. He wrote several of his famous novels at, while in residence at Long Key Fishing Camp. There's the train coming in a little bit more than 100 years ago now and some of the 10,000 people in Key West who turned out to greet them. That's some of the mighty 10,000, more than half of the population. Uh, Key West was the most important city in, in uh, Florida at the time, far and away uh, larger than Miami with 1,000, uh, Jacksonville with 4,000, Tampa with 2,000. It was a vast center of conference, uh, commerce. It was important and you could only get there by boat before this train was, before this railroad was built. There's Flagler, uh, pretty much infirm by that point uh, at 82, being glad-handed. Uh, he was serenaded by a choir of children. One of his comments to Joe Parrott as they were being, walking away from the reviewing stand was, well, I can hear the children, but I cannot see them. Another thing he said to Parrott was, at last I can die fulfilled. And if you see the letter that he wrote, it was one of the rare times where Flagler really, he did play it pretty close to the vest. This is one of the rare times when he let his feelings bubble up to talk about uh, how gratified he was to have seen this project through the end. Much of it, I didn't say, funded by not somebody else's money, not some stockholder's much money. 
his own personal checkbook. Only during the very last stages of the building did he float a few bonds to complete the last section of it. There he is uh, halfway down a long key uh, at, uh, at Marathon, wondering or not whether he was going to push on down the keys. Of course, he eventually did. It's a wonderful photograph. That's some of the artwork, and that's the long key viaduct, which became Flagler's favorite. You can't see it from dry land, so you had to, he had to put photographers on flat bottom boats out in the water and take pictures. They'd stop a train in the middle of the span so as they didn't they couldn't take motion photographs back then. And then they'd stoke the boilers and the and the smoke would start to billow and they'd get a picture that looked as if it had caught the train traversing the uh, tracks, but it was just standing still there while it was being photographed. There, it, he liked it so much it became the centerpiece of the Florida East Coast Railway system. Uh, for all the time uh, until 1935, until the uh, until the, the extension was destroyed, and it is called we John and I like to point out the Oversea Railroad, not the Overseas, and, and it's railway, not railroad. Railway um, proof of all this is in the uh, company documentation. It became known as the Havana Express. You could get on a train in Penn Station on Monday or Tuesday and wake up in that same Pullman car if you want it in Havana on Saturday or Sunday. You probably wouldn't have slept in the Pullman car during uh, the act of being ferried over from Key West to Cuba, but you're, you'd be riding the same car on the rails of Cuba once you got there. Pretty amazing to think about that. Take the railroad from Miami to Havana? Well, in a sense you could. That's the ferry that uh, cars were loaded onto and then taken over those 93 miles to Cuba. That's some pictures of the destruction of the hurricane, which we don't really have time to talk, talk about, that wiped it all away. The railroad was bankrupt in 1935, the, the whole system, the FEC system. The, rail, the right of way sold to the state for about $600,000, not much return on that investment of $50 million. Um, but uh, we did get the highway built, and, and we have Key West and all the other keys as more jewels in the Florida Crown. It was a terrible time. Ernest Hemingway wrote about it, some of the bodies being recovered. Funeral pyres had to be built on the beach. It was, uh, bodies deteriorated so quickly they couldn't even be, they were going to be buried in Arlington at first. Even that wasn't practical. They had to be taken, then they were going to be taken to Miami. Even that not practical and finally burned on the beach with 21 gun salute. A look at uh, Long Key Viaduct after it became a highway in the, in the 1940s. A lot of art photographs have been taken because it remains a beautiful place, even these ruins, the bridges. But to say they are like uh, bits of some modern day stone edge uh, jutting up out of the sea, I do not think is an exaggeration. There's one of the low line trestles uh, converted to a bridge in the 40s, abandoned when the new highway was built in the 60s and 70s, and now become a hiking, biking, and walking trail with observation points along the way. They'd like to build it all the way. I don't uh, from Key Largo to Key West. I don't know if economics will uh, per, uh, permit that. Here's the Bahia Honda Bridge. When they converted the uh, railway into a uh, highway there in the 40s, engineers were stymied when they got to Bahia Honda, that steel bridge where the uh, girders were so narrow it would not allow two-way traffic to pass back and forth. Uh, engineers finally said, "Well." We've got the solution. The thing's built like a brick, you know what? Just put the road right on top of it. And so they did. And then you can still see remnants of a highway built atop a bridge if you go down to uh, Bahia Honda. Some more of the artwork, and uh, here we are. Uh, back up one. Back. Sorry. There you go. Here we are uh, where uh, we have some of the beauty that, that remains. Well, that's, that's all I've got for you today, and I don't know if we've got time to talk a little bit, but I'm happy to do so if we do, John. Questions, yeah. Questions, please. I can, I can barely see because of that light. There's one over here. Yes, sir. Uh, what do you believe the fate of the uh, relic flaggers, bridge structures uh, should be now? They parallel State Road 5 for the DOT. You mean in the Keys? Are we talking? Bahia Honda, what, what should happen to 
Well, what should happen to them? In my eyes, I hope they stay on. They, they really are reminders of this. And, and uh, do I think they need to be restored? No, that's probably not practical. But I think they ought to just, they've been there this long and they haven't heard anything. Why not let them uh, last until, like all those remains of the, the fabled emperor Ozymandias, they turn to dust? I think they ought to be there as a reminder of all I've been talking about today. No reason not to. There's a big controversy about whether or not they should uh, reinforce the little part, the bridge that goes from uh, the mainland out to uh, uh, Pigeon Key, where the where the uh, muse where the uh, University of Miami maintains a research station, and there's a bit of a museum. Whether or not that remains practical, you used to be able to drive a tour bus out there. Now you can only drive a jitney. I don't I don't know if that's practical, but. I don't think we ought to spend any money tearing these things down, that's for sure. Second, right here. Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned that there was really no financial aid to Flagler during the instruction. Did John, two questions. Did John Dean give him any money? No, Rockefeller uh, did not, but other uh, uh, influential bankers and friends of, of Flagler's in New York <clears throat> did buy those bonds. No, I did not. That was not part of all the, uh, you know, while I tried to provide a context for what went on in the building, uh, everything that happened uh, up until the beginning of the, uh, of the overseas uh, railway construction is, is just that context. And other people know a lot more about that, those things than I do. Another question here. You, you uh, quoted uh, a few thousand dollars as being his total profits from the Florida East Coast Railroad. That's what the company claimed, yeah. Right, what the company claimed. Did you come across an estimate as to the value in his real estate that he created because of building the railroad uh, from uh, the northern part of Florida to the southern tip? Did you come across such a number? No, I, nothing. You know, I didn't make a study of this. My sense of it is that uh, what he gained through land sales in of that of those of those grants he received just about offset what he spent on the railroad itself he you know he liked to joke about how much he lost well he did lose but he made up some of it i think that in in essence he about broke even in florida he certainly didn't get rich off florida he got rich off oil yes were there any um, technological or um, innovations that came out engineering innovations that came out of his Building that um, we were able to build off on in future projects. Well, the uh, the the use of reinforcement. This was the the uh, most significant use of the building medium of reinforced concrete. It was proven that it's you know that you could do almost anything with it. Uh, that was the principal thing that was talked about. Uh, other uh, nobody had ever bridged the. Uh, uh, Water with arch-based structures, or in any in any pier, even the pier-based structures to this this length before, and it was all written up in engineering journals of, of the time. Uh, it was fascinating to you know. I don't want to say very much more about concrete and reinforced <laughs> uh, and rebar, but uh, for fear of putting anybody to sleep. But that was principally uh, the uh, the uh, the strong suit of the work, as well as the, just the scope of it. Yeah. Well, well, we've got one more here. There was a shorter way to get to the Keys, which I thought that they were originally going to use, but then abandoned. The question is, there was, a shorter, was there a shorter way to the Keys, which they briefly considered? Yes, the original intent was to go southwestward from Miami directly across the Everglades to what is Flamingo today, and then jump across, oh, about 40 miles of water to the Middle Keys, and then down from there, because they thought it would, building that one long span would be a lot easier than, than starting in Key Largo. But uh, William Crome took a party of surveyors through the Everglades, and they got lost. They nearly died. They had to be brought back to uh, Miami uh, by uh, Indians, 
And when uh, Crum gave his report, uh, Flagler said, well, Mr. Flagler, you might be able to get your railroad to Key West, but you're not going to get it there by going through the Everglades. And that's when they chose to get down to Homestead and across to Fish Creek and then on down. Uh, thank you very, very much for, for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. I wanted to, given uh, Les's great, Dr. Stanford's, I'll say, great influence on this story and, and getting the word out to a nation about this marvelous engineering project, there's a few surprises I wanted to present Mr. S uh, Dr. Stanford with. First of all, um, as I said, the museum published this centennial edition of The Last Train to Paradise, um, but what he doesn't know is that the museum sent it out to, with the help of the Keenan Trust, almost 3,000 libraries from Jacksonville to Key West. So every university, public school, public library, mu history museum library has received a copy of this. It's a special library edition marked as such with a book plate and a special dust jacket. So we hope to keep this story alive uh, through Les's book. Uh, secondly, I wanted to, I thought this would be kind of fun. You know, he talked about Henry Flagler riding his own iron to Key West. Well, we decided it'd be nice to produce a sort of piece of the true cross. We have a section of that iron that Henry Flagler rode over, uh, mounted on a plaque here for less, so that you can actually have your own piece of Henry Flagler iron. <laughs> lastly, um, lastly, the museum uh, produced a limited edition of 100 copies of the book. They're not for sale. They come in a slip cover that is individually numbered. This is copy two. Copy one went to the Flagler Museum archives, as you might imagine. But copy two should go to the author, don't you think? Yes. Copy. <laughs> so what, what's different about this book is that it has a slip cover that's numbered. It has a dust jacket that's numbered and identifies it as a limited edition. It has um, the hardcover numbered as uh, one of what this in case uh, in this case two of 100, and there's a page in the book that's also hand numbered, so numbered in four places. One day when they contact the museum, like people contact uh, the Cody Museum to find out about their Colt revolver, revolver, we'll be able to say, well, that went to uh, Les Stanford or whomever, and verify the numbers. So this is for you, Les. Thank you, Les, for all you've done to make this story so popular. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, this book, by the way, is uh, one of the candidates for the Read Together Palm Beach program. I think there are five counties now that's made this their book to read together. I hope you'll vote. There's a ballot box here at the museum and the museum store, and I believe one at the concierge desk out front. Please do help make our local favorite the book we all read together for Palm Beach County. Ten counties, he said. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're only wrong by half, right? And I wanted to remind you of the next lecture Tuesday night on current Hastings, and a week from tonight we'll continue, or today, we'll continue our lecture series on the great engineering feats of the Gilded Age. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Very much.